We used to just call it rangeland, where cattle ranged and wildlife ranged. Shrub step is just a little more accurate description. 99% of the species are grasses and, and wildflowers, and yet those big shrubs are what you notice first. That's why we call it shrub step. When you put yourself down at the level of that landscape, you are gonna see a forest. It's just gonna be a different type of forest, from the big tall shrubs to the real small lichens. It's all integrated into this amazing landscape. It's just so hard to see when we're standing, it's, you know, a few feet above it, driving by at 60 miles an hour. It's definitely not a desert. It has every component that you'd find in the highest mountains and the highest national parks in the world as far as species of wildlife, species of plants, rare and endangered plants and animals, views, how they're all intertwined together is really special out here. And so I think people are just now waking up to how special it really is. There's so much biodiversity. Big game, small game, coyotes, historically wolves. Burrowing owls. Raptors flying around doing their daily chores of trying to find something to eat. Yellow-headed blackbirds. Bald eagles, golden eagles. We have peregrine falcons. Sage grouse. The sharp-tailed grouse, pygmy rabbit. Washington ground squirrel, white-tailed jackrabbit, black-tailed jackrabbit, pronghorn. Bobcats, a fairly healthy cougar population. You also find elk. There's black bear. It's also not uncommon to see a moose meandering across the shrub step. So many reptiles and amphibians out there that are just so interesting and you won't find them anywhere else. It's not quite like you're you know, in the big forest where it's more obvious what the, what the beauty is. It just takes some time to appreciate. We have 800-foot basalt cliffs, and at any given time of the day, those cliffs are a different color, depending on how the sunlight's striking them. Wildflowers add color to it from the pinks and yellows and reds and blues. It's an amazing amount of color. There is a long cultural history, not just white history, but Native American history. This land holds our history. Our survival has meant understanding this land and the resources and what they can offer. Since time immemorial, we have been taught that this land is a part of us. There's value out here for all kinds of uses, for bird watching, for, for wildlife itself, just for their own livelihoods, for people that use that wildlife, whether it's for hunting or photography or just enjoyment, just to see it. We've been out just exploring wildflowers this spring and we've probably identified 60 species of wildflowers just close to our house. If people wanted to experience, you know, the shrub step actually at night is really amazing. Because it's so hot during the day in the summertime, it actually comes alive at night. The stars are amazing. There's opportunities for biking, for horseback riding, but I just particularly like to walk <laughs> and see it from foot. Looking at the land for our food, that's gonna feed me, it's gonna pee in my children, 
you have a connection with the people that have come before you that have gathered in that area. You have a connection with the people that are gathering alongside you, continuing something that has been done on this land since time immemorial. I feel a lot of people's lies when I'm out in the Shrub Step community, including my own, and including, I think, maybe a, a thought to the future that we're trying to say, hey, you gotta preserve this. You gotta have this. It just can't go away. It just can't go away. It's too valuable. the fire intensity has changed in these landscapes. And so we're getting these mega fires. Historically would have been smaller fires burning less hot, covering less acres, but more often. And now what we have is big fires happening all at once, very hot and doing a lot of damage. That damage then can not always be repaired. When a fire starts in Trub Step, if it's not put out right away, they often become 40, 50, 60,000 acre fires overnight. The shrub step that you find in Washington tends to be very fragmented. What we have tried to do is to focus on programs like converting cropland into conservation reserve program, which has resulted in the conversion of former wheat fields to something that looks and acts like shrub step, and it's supporting a lot of sage grouse. We understood that with our relationship with the resources, sometimes they needed rest, sometimes they needed management. The tribe right now utilizes what's called adaptive management with our partners. I definitely think that partnerships help. So we have partnerships with WDFW to help the different resources. That's something that the Department of Wildlife is trying to do. It's something that they're partnering with us, Conservation Northwest, because it's, it's all our goals together. Way before white settlement, there was history, and we've got a lot to learn there and think about and maybe incorporate into what we're doing today. We've returned species to this land because we've elevated our elders' historical knowledge about this land. And to now see those restoration examples and these things be a part and incorporate our elders' knowledge is huge. What that's gonna result in is it's gonna be more efficient. You're gonna find things that will work because you understand the landscape and what resources worked with each other. Even though we have fragmented shrub step, we don't want to treat those areas as throwaway. We do need to protect and improve the quality of the really big patches and also do whatever we can to connect these smaller patches to the bigger patches. The more we can do to improve the quality of habitat on the big patches, the better we'll be doing for all the shrub step wildlife. It's important that we fight for it and to keep it intact. Literally anybody can be a steward of the shrub step. They often have volunteer days to clean up riparian areas, to take down old barbed wire fences that are hard on the wildlife. So I'm John Galley, a wildlife biologist with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'm leading the recovery effort for the federally endangered Columbia Basin Pygmy Rabbit. Behind me is one of the uh, release areas where we are trying to reestablish a wild population. They're doing what we were hoping. They're acclimating well and they're starting to get established in this area. There's a sage grouse initiative focused on working with private landowners to help sage grouse, but also improve the quality of the habitat. The greater sage grouse in Washington are actually really struggling now. We have three populations of sage grouse in the state of Washington. The largest population with about 90% of the remaining birds is in Douglas County. They're landscape species. They need big landscapes to survive. And they're a shrub step dependent bird, which is an important part of this equation because they live on sagebrush. They eat sagebrush. They have a digestive system that makes them one of the few species that can actually eat the leaves of a plant that other species find poisonous. 
they're basically a very important component of that ecosystem. So when you see that ecosystem, to see sage grouse is to know that that area is functioning like it should. The land and our resources continually tell a story, and it's up to us to go out and figure out how to have a relationship with this land. It's part of our culture. It's part of what makes the West the West. You might just be amazed at how silent it is, and it's a big silence, and I think that's pretty special too. I talked with a rancher yesterday that said, when those bird watchers come out, I love to go talk to them. I love to go explain to them, you know, why those birds are there and what I know about it. That's what it's all about. We don't have this blue-red thing going on. We have an appreciation of the same things. Communities, economies, wildlife, beauty, ecosystem, and it all comes together right here in Shrub Step.